Okay. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the sixth and final Mythmas talk for the Oxford Space and Astronomy Society. Thank you all for tuning in. Uh, today, I am absolutely honoured and humbled to have uh, our very distinguished speaker here today, Professor Raina Weiss, joining us all the way from MIT in the US. Uh, to introduce our speaker, Professor Weiss is a, professor, is a physics emeritus at MIT and an adjunct professor at LSU. Uh, he is known for inventing the laser interferometric technique, which is the basic operation of LIGO. Uh, which is the Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory, which we'll speak about today. Um, he was also chair of the COBE Science Working Group. And as we all know well, uh, in 2017, he was awarded the Nobel Prize in Physics for his work on the detection of gravitational waves, uh, along with Kip Thorne and Barry Barish, um, and a further range of other very high profile scientific awards and prizes for this groundbreaking work. Uh, and this year, he was elected a legacy fellow of the American Astronomical Society. Um, so today we're honoured and we're delighted to have you here with us today, Raina. So um, without further delay, over to you. Thank you very much. Let me see if I can make the technology work, okay? Let's try that. Yep. And uh, here we go. All right, I hope you can see the sort of opening slide. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. Well, okay. Thank you for having me. And uh, I'm talking for a collaboration and you'll, I'll show you the collaboration if I can. Hold on. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. There it is. It's a collaboration of about a thousand people with about 50 or 60 institutions in it. And uh, I don't think the last, I don't, I don't think Oxford is part of it, but there are other English and European universities and organizations that are. And what this group is doing is they're operating and thinking about and writing all the results of the detection of gravitational waves by a whole set of experiments you'll hear about in a minute. So let me start, since not everybody's familiar with this, with a little bit about gravity. Well, this guy you probably know pretty well. Uh, that's Isaac Newton. And this famous formula right here, which most high school kids learn, but it's quite a deep formula, it's a wonderful formula, but it was Isaac Newton's way of making gravity be universal. And I'll tell you what, I'm, what I mean by that in a minute. It, what it says is that the force between two objects, two masses like M1 and M2, the force between them due to gravity, which has a constant here, gets smaller as the distance gets larger by the square of the distance. That's something you learn very early and it turns out this formula is absolutely wonderful. It does everything. It explains apples falling from trees. It explains how the earth gets tied to the sun and all the planets. It even explains the tides. And uh, so why bother with anything else? So it turns out it doesn't work for certain things. And it doesn't work for when masses are moving very fast. And it has no news function in it. What I mean by that, it doesn't have in it in the theory that goes with it, any way of transmitting information from one place to another in space due to gravity. And that's something that got fixed, but in a very awkward way, a difficult way by Albert Einstein. Here's Albert Einstein in a much older time than when he invented what I'm about to tell you. And here is Einstein's formulation of that formula. It looks deceptively simple but it's a stinker. This is a very hard equation to solve. But let me tell you what the equation says. What that equation says is that space and time, which is given by this thing G, how space gets formed, how time changes, is somehow related to the distribution of matter and energy in that space. So the relationship is matter and energy in a space somehow distorts the space and time. I'll try to make this clearer to you in the picture. It's not that, that equation is a stinker, as I said, to solve. And uh, so here is sort of an idea of one way to think what this equation is telling you. Um, in America, we have things called jungle gyms for kids to play around in. These are, you know, parallel bars that assemble and people can walk around inside the parallel bars in three dimensions. And what this is is a cut through a two-dimensional cut 
to those jungle gym. And out here, uh, very, very far away from something which is the sun, there's the sun, uh, the space and the jungle gym doesn't distort at all. It looks just the way you built it. But as you get closer and closer to the sun, space begins to distort. You'll notice it gets curvy like that. And here's the earth. And it has a little dimple of its own in space that it makes. And so what Einstein is telling us that these objects, which are full of energy and mass, both of them, take flat space that's the same as you would have laid out in a jungle gym and distort it. But they do something else which is not in that picture. If you put clocks everywhere, everywhere where there's an intersection of bars, like here and there and there, and you put them all out here where the space is quite far from the sun, all the clocks that you would lay out here would read the same time at the same moment in time. Now, as you get closer to the sun, the clocks that are down in here where space is curved, these clocks would have also been disturbed by the sun and they go a little more slowly than the clocks that are out here. So that's the distortion of time that is done. It's time and space get distorted by mass and energy. And that's the best I can do for you right now about explaining what Einstein's theory of gravity is. We'll come back to this a little bit as we go on in this talk. But if you can imagine that it's a geometric idea and what Einstein has done, he's removed the idea of gravitational forces. They don't exist anymore in this theory. What happens, instead of the Earth being pulled by the sun, the Earth moves in the best way it can in this distorted space. And it goes around the sun, but that's where the distortion is. And so the distortion tells you how these objects move. And there is no longer a gravitational force. Now, this theory has gravitational waves. And I want to show you one of those. And that's what this talk is mostly about. So let me get a drink of water so I can continue. Mm. So in that theory, which Einstein developed in 1915, he had two versions of it, one in 1916 and another one in 1918. It's not important that he made a big mistake in here and, and then he corrected it in this. That's a typical Einstein paper. It's generally a very bold and sometimes there's an error, sometimes there's not. But here's what he already knew in 1916 and got better by 1918. You know, the sources of gravitational waves are non-spherically symmetric accelerated mass motions. In other words, accelerated mass. When you accelerate a mass, and you do it in such a way that it isn't spherically symmetric. And what I mean by that, a thing that, will radi that does, radi does not radiate gravitational waves is something that uniformly expands and contracts all around. That will not make gravitational waves. But something that goes un not, not spherically symmetrically, like things that go around each other or things that crash into each other, those things radiate gravitational waves. So that's, what, that's, the, that's the basis. And by the way, it's not that different than electricity and magnetism. In electricity and magnetism, accelerated charges make electromagnetic waves. Those of you who have studied uh, electricity and magnetism. So that's the source of the waves. And here's the thing that is the way you detect the waves. It's through the kinematics, the way they move. And Einstein assumed, and we will later see that he was damned right. He was very right. But we now know this for a fact. He assumed they propagate at the speed of light. In other words, these waves move as just exactly the same speed of, as light does. And there are a wave that's a transverse wave. What I mean by that, and we'll see a little model of it in a minute, it's these waves, let's say they're traveling toward you coming out of the, out of the computer screen. Uh, what they do is when they're coming at you or they're going into the computer screen, they assert their action perpendicular to the direction in which they're moving. So that's what transverse means in this case. And what they do is this, and here this picture is, imagine a whole bunch of little masses you threw out into space. And here is where you are. That little red square is you. And the mass, that's right where you are. And I'm gonna turn this thing on so it looks like a gravitational wave. Let's see if it works. Yeah, there it goes. And what you'll notice is two things in that picture. One thing is you'll notice that in the, let's call us the X direction, space expands when space contracts in the y direction. It keeps flipping back and forth. But they notice that x and y do opposite things. 
Well, X expands, Y contracts. When Y expands, uh, X contracts. So that's a shearing motion, an interesting shearing motion. That's what the wave induces in space. But there's another attribute of this, which is actually as important. You'll notice that if you're standing right where your red square is, and you look at the masses that are very far from you, like that one and that one, they're moving a lot. They move a lot, but the ones near you don't move very much. And what that is, is very much like the same pattern you would get if you took a rubber band. Well, you need a friend to do this. You pull a rubber band and have your friend make marks on it every centimeter on the rubber band, and then start pulling the rubber band. And the way the marks move is very much like that. There is this it's a stretching of space and a contraction of space. And what is constant in this picture at any one moment changing, but it, what, it, what, is, what is the same is if I take and take the, the amount of motion of this dot, the very furthest one and that one and separate, subtract their motion from each other and divide it by their separation. In other words, the motion delta L divided by their separation, which is L, that is the same all along this moving line. In other words, a small, separa small separation, you get a small motion. And that's true whether you're going in compression or in expansion. So that's the image you want to have. It's that image of what I was just telling you about is called a strain, S-T-R-A-I-N. And that's the way you want to, I think I've given you all you really need to know about gravitational waves so we can go on. But if you have problems with this, well, please, you can ask questions about it. So here's the first person in the world that ever thought of trying to measure these things. And he had, he, this was Joe Weber, who was a physicist, who all started as an electrical engineer. And uh, his idea was simply to take a great big bar of aluminum, and there, this big, big bar, and here he is attaching strain gauges to the bar. These strain gauges would measure those motions that you just saw that picture with the dots. And uh, this big thing would, this big bar of aluminum would be put in a vacuum chamber and closed up. And he hoped for gravitational waves to come along and stretch this bar along one, along, let's say, the horizontal direction and compress it in the y direction, and in the up and down direction. Well, a very clever idea. And he built this. And by about 1960, he started this in 1962. And by 1969, he had three of these bars running, one in a laboratory at the University of Maryland in, in the United States, another one in a golf course not too far from the university, and another one in Chicago, which is sort of the middle of the United States, and in a, in a, in a, in a laboratory there. And he had declared that he'd seen motions in all three of those, we call them bar detectors, uh, that, was, that were simultaneous or close to simultaneous. And he declared that the motions were due to the fact that gravitational waves were coming from the center of our galaxy. Well, that was very exciting. And a lot of people are the joy of doing science is that that experiment, although big, is not impossible. And other people said, huh, let's see if we see the same thing. And all over the world, people started making bars just like this, including Britain. There were people in Britain that did that. They were in Glasgow and uh, in Germany, Italy, uh, Japan, all over the world, and several groups in the United States. And by 1972, it was pretty clear that nobody was seeing what Joe Weber was seeing. And so another idea came along. And this one is in this next picture. And this will take a little bit of explanation, but this is another way of trying to make the measurement, and which had maybe more sensitivity. Uh, and the idea that you're going to be looking at is what's called an interferometer. And what it is, is here's a, this doesn't look like a laser, but a, this will be a little laser in a minute. And a beam of light will shoot out from this, hit something called a beam splitter. What the beam splitter does is it divides the light. Half of it gets reflected and sent to this distant mirror, and then it comes back again. The other half goes through this partial mirror and hits this mirror and comes back again. And then the lights get reflected and, or transmitted to this thing, which is the detector. Now, well, the way it's set up right now, and we'll get this thing moving, it's a little animation. Uh, a gravitational wave will come down on this. All the, imagine all those dots you saw in that picture coming down on this plane. 
and they will start moving these mirrors and you'll see what happens. So let's get it started. Uh, yeah, okay, so now the thing you'll see is red is wherever there's laser or light power. And this wiggly thing that goes along with the light power is the electric field in the light. And you'll notice with the paths being equal on the two sides, equal in length on two sides, no light is getting to the photodetector, no light at all. And now when a gravitational wave comes down on this thing, it'll start moving this mirror in and that one out. And every time that the path lengths are no longer equal in these two, the times the different light appears at the photodetector. So that's the basis of this other idea. It's the same thing as you're gonna look for a stretching along one dimension and a compression along the other, but this time you're gonna use light. And the very special thing you have is that you set it up so there's no light at the photodetector when there's no gravitational wave. And when the gravitational wave comes, light appears at the photodetector. It's a pretty simple idea, but you have to do it very, very carefully. And that's something that Kip Thorne knew. He's, here's a picture of Kip Thorne. And uh, he was one of the first to actually think about how big might gravitational waves be that come from all over the universe. And he came to the conclusion that if you're going to measure a strain, here's a strain, a change in length divided by a separation, and he, they give it a name, call it H. If you're gonna do this and try to detect something that comes from the universe, you're gonna to have to do this to a part in 10 to 21. That's a horribly small number. And let me translate it into what is being actually measured by the gravitational wave detectors that have made the detection. They're about four kilometers long. So L is about four kilometers. And if you now do the multiplication of L times the 10 to minus 21, you wind up with a separation of the masses or the mirrors of four times 10 to minus 18. What is that? Well, that's about a thousandth the size of an atomic nucleus over four kilometers. That seems hard. And in fact, I'll show you how hard it is. If you use the wavelength of light to make the measurement, in order to measure 10 to the minus 18 meters, you have to somehow split light up into 10 to the 12 parts. That's hard, but it can be done. But worse is this one right here. You gotta make sure those mirrors that are mo moving with the gravitational wave, then they will be kicked around by a lot bigger things than gravitational waves. And in fact, the amount of motion of the earth right where you're sitting at, in your room is about 10 to the minus 12 of the wavelength of light, uh, 10 minus 12 of the motion of the, sorry, is about 10 minus 12 of a wavelength. I said it wrong. It's about 10 to minus six wave, it's 10 minus six wavelengths. And it's about one micron of motion. So it's about 10 to the minus 12 of a wavelength that you, or 10 to the minus 12 of the motion of the light, of the motion of the earth that you have to measure. So let me say it carefully. 10 to the, you have to measure the motion of the earth or the motion of that mirror, 10 to the 10 to the minus 12 times smaller than the motion of the earth right under it. And that was a very hard job to do. So I think I finally said it right. All right, here's the way it was done. This is about, in fact, the instrument that did it. And some of this you're familiar with. Here is the laser and here's the beam splitter. We had that in the, in the picture of just a second ago. And here's that distant, mir distant mirror. And here is this other distant mirror. There's some other things in here. What do they do? Well, let's look at analyze what they do. But this is a partial mirror. What it does, it takes the light and bounces it back and forth between the, the, the distant mirror and this mirror many times, about three, 300 times. What that's effectively making the thing very much longer, or you get more sensitivity to small motions of that mirror by doing that. And that's done on both of these. And you do that exactly the same on both, both arms so that the time that light spends in here is the same as light spends in here. So if when there's no light going to the photodetector, when there's no light going to the photo, when there's no gravitational waves, all the light goes back to the laser. That's what happens. I didn't show you that in the other picture, but it wasn't drawn properly for that. So what happens when you send all the light back to the laser? Well, that's terrible. The laser doesn't like that, but you can put another partial mirror here. And this is a tricky mirror. Uh, it's a mirror that would transmit a little bit of the light back to the laser, but also there's light coming from the laser that's reflected by this. 
And what you do is you take the light that's transmitted from the interferometer out back to the laser and make that equal in amplitude to the light that's reflected by the mirror from the laser. And you make them cancel interferometrically, just the way you made the light cancel to the photodetector. And when you do that, you effectively build up the light in here, in this little cavity. And where there might be 50 watts of light coming out of the laser, you have 10,000 watts of light in here. And then in here, you have something like a quarter of a megawatt of light. So you've done a lot of tricky stuff. This mirror, I'm, I will only explain in questions. It's something you put between the detector and the bone. And it, what it allows you to do is change the response of the interferometer. It's a little tricky, and I don't want to talk about it until I, I am forced into it by questions. So here is sort of the noise curve for this whole system. In other words, what is in this picture is the spectrum of H. How much H, that's how much strain, is there at each frequency? And, and it's per bandwidth. In other words, it's a spectrum per, per square root of bandwidth. And I just want to, what I want to point out to you is this is as you go down from up here, go down, you get more and more sensitivity. So very sensitive is down the bottom here. Here is not sensitive. And here's frequency. This is 10, this is 100, 100 hertz right there. That's sort of the frequency of C below middle C on the piano. That's 120, uh, 100, 125 hertz. Um, and uh, so here are various things that are plotted that make noise that keep you, how well can you do in measuring the spectrum of a gravitational wave coming in? And yet, this is the region, the initial region of initial LIGO that was able, this is what we got when we built LIGO. And here is the quantum noise of light, just the fact that light is in photons and that limits you. And then in here, there's a little region which when you hang those mirrors, you have to worry about hanging them in because you're doing it at room temperature. They get wiggled by just the heat. The heat is wiggling everything and it wiggles it a little bit in this frequency range. And here is the seismic fluid. This is the noise from the earth, which you haven't been able to kill. So we had this little region in here where we were sensitive. And here are other things that come into it. And I won't go into all of them here. But we had to pump the gas out of the long arms you'll see in a minute. Otherwise they would have made trouble. Here's sort of the residual gas would make trouble. And uh, then there's one thing which I think I do want to point out, and that's this thing called radiation pressure. In other words, the quantum nature of light not only causes phase fluctuations here, but it causes force fluctuations on the mirror. It's like being like the mirrors are being hit by a, a rainstorm, and, but they're a photon rainstorm, and that causes the mirrors to wiggle. And so it turns out this line and that line are the quantum limits for these measurements on macroscopic systems. So that tells you a little bit about how sensitive you have to be. You have to make the instrument so sensitive that you can begin to see the quantum fluctuations. And we'll have more to say about that as we go on. Okay, so here is then uh, the layout. Uh, where do the detectors were put? In the United States, there was one up in the Pacific Northwest and another one in the, so in the south of the United States in Louisiana. Uh, there's another, the, and this is four kilometer long detectors. I'll show you that in a minute. Uh, and then there were a detector in Europe that was built in near Pisa. That's an Italian French detector. That's about three kilometers. The Germans built with the Scots together, built a 600 meter detector, which was used mostly to develop new ideas. And now there are a new detector that's just come on the air called Kagwa that's in a mountain in Japan. And then there's another detector that's in the process of being built in India. Now, why you want so many detectors, you'll see as we go on, but it's important to have more than one. In fact, you would like to have at least four of them when you want to finally do astronomy. And we'll get to that at the end. So here's a picture of LIGO and I'll walk you. This is a little travel log of LIGO. Uh, this is uh, in Louisiana. Uh, this is a little movie, but what you see here is a central building. And these are tubes which carry the laser light to a mirror, which is way at the end here. And then this is the other direction and carries the light back and forth along this tube. And this is a huge installation. And let me start it. Um, so this is the, in Louisiana. And then here it is in upper north, in the Northwest of the United States. Here's what it looks like up there, the 
concrete cover over the vacuum system, the same as in Louisiana. And then here is a vacuum, which is very good, better than almost the vacuum of outer space. And here are people working on an ordinary optical system as you were working in a laboratory in your own university. And here's the control room for the whole the system. And here are people learning how to operate the, operate the device. So it's an interesting mixture of big science with little science. And so this was our first, and this is, this is the, like the, the stick diagram I showed you. This is again, a picture of sensitivity, but this time in how small a displacement you can measure, the spectrum of the displacement measurements. And here it's 10 to the minus 11 meters per square root Hertz. And down here, it's about 10 to the minus 19. And here again, it's frequency. And you can see this is sort of a, we're very proud of this. The people who worked on LIGO worked very hard on this, but they took a long time. The very first time they put it together, they got a performance that looks like this thing up here. Not very good. And they kept working on it. And you can see these are all the dates of different curves. And eventually we got down to here. And what's interesting about this curve is that it is on, you don't see the theoretical curve, but it sort of peers out in here. That dotted curve, dash dotted curve, is a theoretical curve for the instrument, knowing all the things we know about it. We didn't quite make it to the best we could, but once we got to about 60 hertz, something like 50 hertz, we got, we got, as we got up to theoretical, and that was very impressive to all of us. And what we could say is we saw no gravitational waves at all. We saw a clean non-detection. Now, you would think that's a failure. No, it wasn't. It wasn't a failure because you see, we had ideas how to make this better. And we already told people that we needed a better probably, but we had to get to at least show that this technology could work. And that's something in your own lives. When you have something sort of preposterous and numb new, you'll generally have to build something to prove to people that you're not completely crazy. Well, that was part of this. So what we did is we improved it. And we improved it in regions where we were not, let me go back. We improved it so that we got closer to the theoretical curve, right in at low frequencies. That's, and that's where we expected to see sources anyway. So anyway, the first thing we did is we made a be better ground noise isolation system and got more rid of the thermal noise. And the way that's done is by making pendula. And let's say the ground is attached to one end of the spring, so the ground, and then you hang a pendulum, just a mass. This is a mass. And this is with, uh, with, uh, with these wires. Then you hang another pendulum from the first one. So here's a second pendulum. And then you hang a third pendulum from that one. And then finally, you have this very precious mirror, which is the mirror that is your test mass hanging from the, the so there are four pendula in series here. And that gets you down into the regime where each pendulum gives you a certain reduction in the, the, the noise of the vibration that is induced up here. But that isn't enough. Here is a very, here's a tricky idea, which actually works beautifully. You take this set of pendula and hang it from a platform, this platform right up here. And here you can see that set of pendula all hanging from it. And here you make something called an active vibration isolation system. And any of you, many of you probably have headphones that do exactly what this does. Maybe you go into a noisy place like an airplane and you put your headphones on and turn the battery on and you find that you can reduce the noise that's in, from the airplane by doing the following and just amplifying the noise in the airplane, inverting it and putting it into the sound along with the music you're interested in. And that cancels the noise from the airplane. That's the same thing that's happening here. You have ground noise that's driving this platform and you have a seismometer which measures, that's like the headphone. The seismometer measures the ground motion or the motion that's on this platform. And what you do is you make a device with pushers on it that push on the, this platform to cancel the motion of the ground. And you do this twice. There are they're little seismometers and bigger ones. And you know, this is a, a series system. So finally, we got down to a place where we, saw something. And this is the first thing we saw. Very close to after we started building that system, and this was called Advanced LIGO, we saw almost within a week after we just said we were almost ready to start running, we saw this. And this picture is picture of time down here versus strain 
it says 10 minus 21 units. And you can see this is junk. And slowly something emerges out of the junk. And there's something which looks, well, interesting. And then this is junk again. Now here's the same thing at the, this was the signal as we saw it in Louisiana. And this is a signal as we saw it in the Pacific Northwest. And the same kind of thing, junk and something emerging out of the junk. And then you compare the signals and you can put them together on the same plot. And then you can see just what I was telling you, uh, they're not perfectly the same, but they're enough the same given the noise in the instrument that you could characterize this as being, at least in this region right in here, that this is a signal you could do something with. And uh, let me show you another way to look at that signal. Another way to look at that signal is again, with time this way, and now the frequency that each of the component, here's the time series that we've been looking at. And that time series can be represented as a set of frequencies, all different. And that's what this is here, for example, is middle C right there, 256. And this plot right over here shows you how much of the, this time series is at all these frequencies. So right here, it's really bright. And so right around C, middle C, the C below middle C up to middle C, this is a very strong signal. And the same thing up at Hanford. I mean, Livingston, Livingston, and here's Hanford. Let me try to play it for you. You hear, you hear that boop, boop. Well, we can make it a little more interesting to listen to, but faking it a little bit by stretching the frequencies. I hope you heard that. And what it is, is was a very important thing to us. We didn't believe it for a while. We thought all sorts of things, but finally we managed to understand the signal. And it turns out there's a little miracle associated even with what you're about to see here. What you're about to see is a numerical solution of those Einstein equations that I showed you earlier for two black holes going around each other. And you'll see a picture of this very much like the jungle gym picture I showed you at the beginning of the talk. And here is down here is the waveform. Now we didn't see all this lovely waveform here because that was way before we were able to see it on, the, on LIGO. But the, what we saw on LIGO was only this little bit over here. And now you'll see what happens. Let me turn this on and I'll describe it as we go along. Uh, here are the two black holes. You can see those two little black things going around each other. <laughs> and the space below is a two dimensional space and what you see colors, the colors tell you the time at the clocks. Where it's green, it's the clocks are moving quickly. And where it's red, they're not so fast. And where it goes black, time goes stop. And the little arrows in this thing are the strains in that space. And above it is just those pair of black holes and the time is on the left. And they're getting closer and closer to each other as they go around each other. And you'll see more interesting things happening in a minute. Uh, now we're getting close to the point when they are almost about to collide. <coughs> you can see a major distortion of space. And look down, you can see the light, time has stopped inside the space where the black hole is. Now we are uh, the black holes merging. <coughs> and now the whole thing becomes very quiet. And the, those little waves that are running away from it are the gravitational waves of that event. Now, what you saw there, as I say, is not an animation written, driven by, um, writ, drawn by uh, an artist. This was the output of a computer solving Einstein's equations. And, <coughs> well, okay. Uh, what, uh, this was a little after we made that discovery, we had a press conference. It, it took us five, almost four or five months before we had the courage to actually tell people about it. Partly because of a lot of things, you know one of them. One of them was that the first measurements of gravitational waves by Joe Weber had failed and most of them people were very skeptical of the field. So we had to be very, very careful that we were right. But we gave a press conference in, in, the more, in 2016 about this in, in February and I was on the subway in New York in March and here's what I saw on the subway. It says, 
This is just to tell you how this got into the popular image so quickly. Scientists found gravitational waves in outer space. If only it were that easy to find an apartment in New York City with a walk-in closet. I mean, that this is, you know, no, nobody knows what's going on, but they, this sort of captured the imagination. Here, uh, this is a cartoon in one of the magazines like, uh, like, like, like what's well, a New Yorker magazine, but you have Comfort Punch is the equivalent in, in Britain. And here is two birds sitting on a branch and one is saying to the other, was that you I heard just now? Or was it two black holes colliding, that chirp that you heard when I played you the sound? So, you know, it's interesting. People got into this science very fast. They thought it was absolutely wonderful. And what it was indeed wonderful. So let me tell you a little more about what we saw a little after that. So here is the event. Now that you're a little bit familiar with it, this is the event we've been talking about. It has a name now. It's, uh, it's in the month of September on the 14th of 2015. That's what that is. And here's this, this strain again. And the 10 to the minus 21 is sort of, it goes, well, here's one times 10 to the minus one. So this is the one we saw. A little bit later and in October, this is before we published this, we saw something we weren't sure of. It looked like that. Uh, it could have been the black hole or something else, but we weren't sure of it. So we didn't use it. But Christmas day, or what they, I think in England, they call this boxer day, the day after uh, Christmas, we saw something we believed and that was this thing. And now what are all these things? Well, what we saw, and this is what that solution of the Einstein equations gave us, the very first one we saw was a black hole, the one had 36 solar masses, and the other one had 29 solar masses, and three solar masses of energy flew off from that system as gravitational waves. In fact, this little collision, which lasted only about, well, a tenth of two tenths of a second, put enough energy into the universe to be brighter than anything in the universe, probably a hundred times brighter than the whole universe at that time, for that little little moment of time. Uh, and uh, the one we believed after that was a lot lighter. It was 14 masses, solar masses, and seven and a half, and only one solar mass went and so forth. So this was what our beginnings were. And we published the paper after, well, we published the paper after, after um, uh, we were sure of things, and we had seen this also. So uh, then a very exciting event happened. This is a little bit later. You can see when it was. This is uh, an event in, October, in August of uh, 2017. And this time, Virgo, the detector in Italy, was also operating. And here is, so since you know a little about this, here are the time series. And here's, the, here's what the sound, sonogram looked like for... Hanford, and this is what it looked like for Louisiana. And here, there is something which is above the noise in the Virgo detector. And here's a time series for it. Now, why is that so important? And it turns out this is the reason why we want to have so many detectors. Uh, here is a picture of the sky right there. And you're trying to put place with where is this source that's making this signal? Where is it in the sky? And LIGO alone, just Hanford and Livingston alone, could do no better than, this is a picture of the sky, a whole picture, the whole 360 degrees worth of sky in this little picture. But we couldn't tell anybody, an astronomer, where to look, that if they want to find this thing, any better than this banana right there. It's about a thousand square degrees of uncertainty. That's terrible. Most astronomers would laugh you off if you told them that you have to look over a thousand square degrees. But by having Virgo also see this, you could narrow down the thing to about 30 square degrees. What's going on here? The way LIGO or any of these gravitational wave detectors work, uh, what it means is you'll take the time it takes for the signal between different locations. For example, the very first one we saw, uh, the, the one that's a very big one, well, we saw the signal first in Louisiana. The signal then went through the Earth. The Earth doesn't stop a gravitational wave. And then it came to the Pacific Northwest after that. So that we knew from that alone, it was about seven milliseconds of time. It took it to make that to go from Louisiana up to Pacific Northwest. That uh, told us that this source was somewhere in the South. Now, if you have more detectors, you can do better because you have more differences in time to do it. That's the way you can determine where the source is. And that's very important if you're gonna try to do astronomy as you'll see in a minute. So here now is up to about a year ago, 
is all the things that we knew about black hole binaries. Uh, this is the mass of the binary. This is not a picture of time or anything. It's just, this is the mass of the black hole this way and the things that have been discovered. So here, for example, the little, the, 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 the little ones that are in here, uh, small ones, yeah. They, many of these were known from just looking at X-ray sources and looking at two stars going around each other, one which you could not see. And that's where the first black holes were discovered. On the other hand, all the ones which look like they have arrows between them, like this one starts over here uh, and winds up, um, well, wait a minute. Yeah, this is, this is a better example. Uh, here, this is the biggest one we found. These two, these two get together and they make a bigger one. But these are all these things that are LIGO things that were discovered by LIGO and Virgo together. So we now have a, uh, we have something like 50 black hole pairs that we have discovered. Now here is the, probably one of the most exciting things that happened to us. And this happened in, also in August of 2017. We saw another kind of gravitational wave. This is completely different, look at it. Here is the sonogram for that. Here are the frequencies again, and here's time. This one, as you can see, this are two detectors together, the LIGO detectors. And uh, this lasts about 10 seconds. Doesn't, it isn't a, a, tenth of a tenth of a second anymore. This makes a chirp that I'll play for you. This is what it'll sound like. Like that. Well, that turns out to be, we, and we will tell you more about in a second, but the, the two neutron stars, they're not black holes, they're lighter than black holes, and they're pretty close. This was about 140 million light years away, as we'll find out in a minute. And here is what we at LIGO saw, but boy, was there something interesting going on. There was also seen by a, 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 the Fermi satellite, which is a gamma ray telescope, that's in space. And here's the energy band of that particular uh, channel. And they saw something about two seconds later. There it is, that thing. And in a, and the higher energy, it's even better. They saw a, a thing that looked like it came from that part of the sky, as we'll see. And another telescope saw it also, another telescope, gamma ray telescope in space. So that's spectacular. And what did that tell us? It told us something really wonderful. It told us that <clears throat> here, whatever it is out there, we believe it's two neutron stars, and I'll show you that in a minute. But we now know that these things tell us that the velocity of gravitational waves, how fast the gravitational wave moves, and how well an optical and electromagnetic wave moves must be very much the same. Because for, for 140 million years, these two things have been moving together. And they only are different in time by two seconds in 140 million years. And when you solve the arithmetic for that, you find out that the speed of gravity waves, gravitational waves and the speed of light is the same to a part in 10 to the 15. So Einstein was right on the mark when he guessed at the velocity of light. Now here is the important thing that came of this otherwise, is here is again, a picture of the sky. And here is <clears throat> the banana of uncertainty that comes from the LIGO observation. That's it, both places. And here, when you add Virgo to it, it reduces the uncertainty to this. Here's the uncertainty from the Fermi satellite. And this all was good enough, especially with Virgo and LIGO seeing the thing. Uh, I'd be a little careful. Virgo didn't see it. But we, by inference, by the fact that it didn't see it, it meant that the signal was in a zone of quiet. It turns out that there is, the, there is a zone of quiet which is about 45 degree cone to the plane of the detector. It had to be in that plane, otherwise Virgo would have seen it. And so with that, that was enough to prove. And so what came of that is with knowing that and knowing with Virgo's non-detection, but knowing where it was and LIGO's detection, you could pin it down to this little thing. And we sent out a telegram to people, go look in this region of the sky for something. And what they found is a galaxy and GC4493, there's the galaxy. And here are the stars in our, in our own galaxy. That's a distant galaxy. And lo and behold, there was a new spot here, right there. 
with a two omar marker. Here is the same picture taken 20 days before. Again, here's that galaxy, and here is the stars, the same place in our own galaxy, and there was nothing there. So, wow, did the, everybody went nutty over this. And every telescope that could do anything to look at this thing went at it. And they discovered a huge amount of stuff, really wonderful, interesting stuff. And so here is now a picture of what this is. Here is a two neutron stars that are, they are converging on each other. They smash into each other and they make a black hole. But before the black hole gets formed, they make a cloud of nuclear matter, which is what's in the neutron star. I didn't tell you exactly what is a neutron star. A neutron star is a, a star the size of the, well, it's the size of a city. It could be a little smaller than London, in fact. Uh, and, uh, but it has the mass of the sun. So the stuff is enormously dense. It's, it has a density of about 10 to the 15 grams per centimeter cube but it's all neutrons and with some protons. And it makes a hell of a display. These things come at each other very close to the velocity of light. They make a cloud that is enormously hot and they call that a kilonova. And so endless amounts of radiation, both nuclear radiation, I mean, nuclei colliding and making, making more gamma rays, but also optical radiation, UV radiation, gamma rays, and, and also radio waves come out of this. And for example, we know that there was a black hole formed because the radio waves saw a jet coming out of that region. And the people doing x-ray astronomy saw, uh, saw the, a little bit of the black hole surroundings. So what was going on then is that a huge number of telescopes all over the world for the next, or they're still doing it, have been looking at this single collision. And here are some things that have been learned from that. It's a very interesting, one of the interesting things is this picture. Uh, and uh, this is a different way of drawing the periodic table. I'll, I'll remind you a little of that. Here is hydrogen. And then here is helium way over here. And there's a color coding done in that picture. And the color coding is important. So for example, if anything is this bluish color, that came from the initial explosion that made the universe. In other words, all the hydrogen, most of the hydrogen in the universe was made at the beginning and almost all the helium, but a little bit is also made in stars, as you can see, because it's a little bit of yellow here and a little bit of green. So those are the other sources of making elements that are different than hydrogen. And then you can see some of the things, you can see a tiny bit of lithium is made by the initial explosion, but most of it's made in stars where it's cooked up and making nuclear reactions in, in stars like in our sun. And uh, then you have stars that have made a lot of stuff and explode and they distribute stuff all over. That's again, being made in stars. And so, uh, and, and the, uh, so you now look at this picture and you'll see something that you don't get any of the heavy elements, the, the, the heavy things like these. Some of them are made in little amounts in, co in cosmic rays. Uh, uh, and some, because they have huge cross sections are also made in stars, but things like platinum and gold are not made in, uh, in, in stars. They're made in these merging neutron star collisions. So something people have guessed at that, but it turns out we now know that for all these things that are purple in here, and some of them are very favorite stuff that we like, was, are made for the, all of our stuff that's made in the universe is made of, that is of those elements is made in neutron star collisions. That's something we didn't know for sure, but now we know that. So that's one thing we found out. The other thing we found out <clears throat> is something which is a little trickier, and this will play a role in the future. Uh, I think I'll spend the time to explain it and then go on uh, to uh, skipping some other things. What this is is a picture of something which we know uh, you, you'll have to know a little more about. Namely, that everything in the universe that when you look out is expanding away from everything else. The universe is like blowing up and it's getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And there's a relationship between the velocity that something has and the distance it's away from us. That ratio of the velocity that something has relative to the earth or relative to anything else uh, and the distance it's away is called the Hubble constant. And this is what this is a constant it's, here it is in a strange units. That's H, that's the Hubble constant. It's in kilometers per second, that's velocity per 
megaparsec. That's just a way of saying three for three million light years per three million light years. So, uh, so, so that's the constant. And here, that constant is very important constant in cosmology. When you think about when you look at the whole universe, and people have measured this by looking at supernova. When supernova happen, they get a very bright light. And that bright light they can measure, and you can measure the what's called the redshift, the, which is the Doppler shift of the of the of the light from the star, because it's moving away from you. It's shifted into the longer wavelengths. You measure that, and you try to measure its distance from you by all sorts of different tricks. Namely, you look at the intensity of the light. And you think you know the source. That's one way to get the distance because it goes down as one over the distance squared. So here's the best guess that people had made measurements of the Hubble constant by supernova. Here is the, the guess you get from measuring the using the cosmological solutions of the from the big from the Big Bang. And I won't explain to that, but there's another way to get the Hubble constant out of just looking at the the, the peaks. There are some peaks in the cosmic background radiation, which is that three degree radiation that is, the universe is full of. And, they, and these don't quite agree. That's a big, exciting topic nowadays. I'm not that worried about it. For years, these things were off by factors of two. Now they're slightly different by 5%. We'll, we'll find out what's going on here. But here is a thing which is a probability distribution for the following effect. This is the effect that comes from those two neutron stars. And now you have something very interesting. And you can do this whole thing all over again. You can use the two neutron stars and you can measure their mass by looking at the waveform that they make. Now you already know pretty much for a neutron star how, how, how heavy they are, but you put that mass into the Einstein equations and calculate the strain that two uh, neutron stars have as they go around each other. You, you can calculate that strain from the Einstein equations and then you go to your, tel you go to your gravity wave detector and measure how big the strain is, and compare that to the strain calculated as though you were at the source. And that tells you, it tells you everything you need to know. It tells you almost everything you need to know. It tells you the distance. That's the most important part, completely without any other references. In other words, we, by measuring the strain amplitude against the calculated strain, you know how far away you are from the source. And that gets you the distance. And then if you know the redshift that's the, in the, the lines in the galaxy, that where you saw this, then you know how, f you know what the, the, de the, the amount of velocity is that it, they have. And you could also get this from the neutron stars themselves, but that's something that will come later. But by doing it first, just from the, from the velocity of the neighboring galaxy or the galaxy this thing is in, you get a curve which gives you a, the Hubble constant, which peaks, that's on, I mean, it's just fortuitous, it's here. It gives you a probability distribution that looks like that. So now you have a completely new way of measuring the Hubble constant, if you want. And this is gonna be used in the future, especially as we get more and more neutron stars. And it will settle a lot of interesting issues. It'll take gravitational waves into cosmology. I think I'm gonna skip the next two things and go to the future. And this is now the future of where the field is gonna wind up where in the next, let's say 15 years, 20 years. What you're seeing here is a picture of the strain, the same thing that you've seen in other pictures versus the frequency. And here is the LIGO picture that is what made the first detections. And the theoretical curve for advanced LIGO is down here. So we can make it still better, it gets better. As you go down, remember it gets more sensitive as you go down. Here's a project that's being worked on right now called LIGO A+. And there's a corresponding project <coughs> going on in Italy, which is called Virgo+. Plus. And we will probably get another probably factor of three in sensitivity out of all of this. And that means we can look not, we can look uh, three to the cube deeper into space because we wanna look at the volume. So that's something like 30 times or 27 times, uh, more sources we will see. And that still doesn't get us, as you'll see in a minute from this diagram on the right, we have to do better than that if we wanna see everything in the universe. And that's what's being planned both in Europe and in the United States. And the picture here is for the United States thing for a thing called Cosmic Explorer, which is about 40 kilometers long, it's 10 times larger than LIGO. And it has two versions as the technology improves. And I wanna show you what it means to get down in here. 
And that's this is a very attractive picture to show you that. So if you look at the color coding here, that corresponds to the color coding of as you go out in this picture, you're looking deeper and deeper into space, further and further away. And let's look over on the right. These white dots are the distribution of black hole pairs. And right now, uh, with, uh, with, with the run we've, we've, we've just completed, O2, we're uh, able to see a few black holes, the ones who they're all the ones within this, within, within this radius between here and there. So when we get to A plus, we get out into the middle of this distribution. But if you go down to Explorer and both Cosmic Explorer one and two, you're way out here. You're now so out far with sensitivity that you're looking at everything in the universe that is as far out as you can go. And here's what's called the redshift, which is the thing that's one way of measuring the distance from the Hubble constant. And on the left here is a picture for new neutron star binaries. And it's the same picture there, you, but there, as you go and go down each of these projects, right now we've only seen one or two of these neutron star binaries. And when we get out here, we'll maybe see maybe two or three a year. But if we want to go and see a lot of them and include most of the population of neutron stars, you're going to have to go down to here. And then if you want to see everything in the universe, you're going to have to go down to, to do the very best you can, which is this purple thing. So this is sort of a feeling for the future. And what it is, is it takes gravitational wave their search and puts it into cosmology. In other words, the big effort will be now you can do cosmology, you can look at all of the universe and you can start thinking about theories of the universe. And here's my last slide. Um, so here is a, the sort of future and present for the whole field of gravitational wave research astronomy. And it's a spectrum, uh, it goes from, down here is the frequency of the gravitational wave. Here's 10, 10 kilohertz. And that goes all the way down to one period per age of the universe. It's probably easier to see it up here. Here's the time that's associated with that frequency. So here it's 10 to minus three to 10 to minus one seconds. In this region, it's around a minute, then hours, years, and then ages of universe. So it's a huge range. And here's a huge range of strains that are associated with it. So now you get an idea of the picture. And these represent projects that are going on. For example, here's the one we've been talking about for the last hour. That's LIGO. And it looks at binary coalescences, which you now know a lot about. And it is well, eventually, as we get it better and better, it'll take us all the way to the edge of the universe with the thing I showed you. Here is another project, which is also quite far advanced, which is doing this in space with a satellite system where you put three satellites that we range with lasers that you put them in a, uh, in a equilateral triangle and put them in an orbit around the sun. Here's the sun, at, but at an orbit that is at the distance of the sun as, the, as, as much as the earth. In other words, this is one AU out. And you can make a very clever orbit, which does a very clever station keeping to this triangle. You don't have to have much delta, you don't have that much uh, rocket power to keep this thing in an orbit like that. So it turns out these three things will be doing some spectacular stuff. They would be looking at the collisions of massive black holes like the one in our own galaxy. 10 to the five solar mass black hole lives right in the middle of our galaxy and they're all over the place. So we'll see those and we'll see little things falling into big black holes. And that's gonna be very good for testing the general theory of relativity. And you'll also see sort of white dwarf stars that are many, many, many of them in our own galaxy. When they go around each other, they will make a background of gravitational waves. So there's a lot of gravitational waves that will be seen by this. And that will fly in about, we think in 20, in somewhere in the early 2030s. It's a project that's being done by the Germans, and, well, America's part of it, the Germans and the Scots are deeply responsible and so are the Italians for this. Uh, now there's a project that's already going and that's using pulsars, these uh, neutron stars, which are very good clocks on their own. They rotate and they make a very good clock by having a, a beam of, of radio waves that always get shot at the earth every time that beam crosses the earth. And that is the rotation of the, of the, of the pulsar. Uh, that does that. And these are very, very good oscillators, especially ones that are very old. And you can use them as a way of measuring gravitational waves that go through our galaxy. 
uh, but only over very long times, periods of years, fractions of years. So what you do is you compare a gravitation wave that goes through the galaxy and you take two neutron stars, two pulsars, and watch how they get accelerated by the gravitational wave and their frequencies get changed. So you measure the timing of the pulses from the pulsars and they will get changed as the gravitational wave go through the Earth, to go through the galaxy. And people are measuring that. They think they may have seen something. They're not quite sure yet, but they have a first smell of a detection. Here is the last experiment. And this is the one that I think is most fascinating. And uh, is that it turns out that, and this is my last topic, is that and this is an experiment that is going on right now to look at the gravitational waves that were generated by an, ep an epoch in the universe when it went through very, very rapid expansion. It's called inflation. And during that time, the universe changed by 30 orders of magnitude in size. It's just unbelievable in a very, very short time, a time less than 10 to minus 20 seconds. It's an unbelievable time, but it's a time when quantum mechanics, quantum theory becomes part of cosmology. And that what it does is that we expect, and this is what the theory now predicts, that there should be gravitational waves generated by the quantum fluctuations of that very early instant. And so they, they, they then propagate into the rest of the universe as it gets generated by its expansion. And now what's being done here is that you can't measure those waves directly with LIGO or any of these projects yet. That's a project that's probably 50 years away. And as people are talking about it, if you're interested in looking at that, go look up on you know, the web, Big, Big Bang Observer. That's a project designed specifically to make a direct measurement of that very early gravitational wave from the initial be beginning of the universe. That's very hard to do, but eventually, and I think in the lifetime of people who are younger, not me and others, you, we may be very well be able to do that. But right now you can do another kind of measurement. You can measure the cosmic background radiation, which is this electromagnetic radiation that comes from the big explosion. And you can look at a property of it, the polarization of that radiation. And that polarization, that's the way the electric field points that's coming at you, um, where how the electric field is transverse to the wave that's coming to you. That polarization is determined by density fluctuations that are occurring in the plasma of the Big Bang that are induced by the gravitational waves that came from that very interesting epoch at the very earliest moments. And those cause certain patterns in the polarization. And that's called the B mode. And people are looking for those right now. Maybe they'll see something. And if they do, that'll be one of the most interesting discoveries of all. Namely, they will have for the first time a direct measure. And you can only do this with gravitational waves. There's another other way to do it. Um, uh, the gravitational waves, well, you'll do it here with this electromagnetic one, but the effect they have on them. Uh, and that will tell you, a little bit about what really went on at the instant of time t equals zero. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Raina. Are you able to stop sharing? Great. You said you have questions, maybe. I don't know what you have. We've got lots and lots and lots of questions. Actually. Oh, my God. OK, um, good. Um, I've had to be very brutally selective, so I do apologize in advance to anyone whose question I don't get to read out in the interest of time, your, your time. Um, so I'll start with some very technical ones. Um, so can regions of extreme space-time curvature, such as around black holes, um, form boundaries for which gravitational waves may diffract from? Say that again, can you do what with the black holes, the boundary, say please again, slowly. So region where you have extreme um, space-time curvature like around the black hole, yeah. uh, can that create uh, a boundary that will cause- Yes, okay, that's a good question. That, that stuff I didn't, that stuff that looked like junk when, I, when we talked about the first measurement of the black hole, mm -hmm. uh, back the very, when, the very first one we saw, as we improve the detector, we should see something which is really quite spectacular, which is just what you're asking. Namely, that as that black hole the form out of the two of them, 
the space around the big black hole has been perturbed. Has, and, and they're, and in fact, their normal modes of the geometry of space-time, which oscillate as the black hole in the end forms. And that's not in the black hole. That's in the space around the black hole. And people have begun to see that, they think. This is, these are called the normal modes of the metric around the black hole. People think they have begun to see this. And if you're really interested in this, there are now some papers that have reanalyzed that very first event and said, yes, there's a little bit of that you can see, about two, five, five, ten percent of that waveform, if you analyze it carefully, is due to that normal mode oscillations of the metric. But it's fully expected. Thank you. Um, will the more isotropic antenna pattern in the proposed Einstein telescope result in a better sky localization? Well, yeah, well, I mean, the, the, the antenna pattern I didn't show you of the detectors, but what they look, it looks like a peanut, the antenna pattern. In other words, there's certain directions where you, we don't detect. In other words, if you take the plane of the gravitational wave, that plane, which, you know, they have a plane in which the laser light moves. If you draw a, a vector perpendicular to that and then make a cone of 45 degrees around that, that there's a dead zone right in that, okay? And that's true in both directions going up as well as going down, because you can forget about the Earth. The Earth doesn't stop anything. So there are there's a there's a cone of silence in at 45 degrees, and that's what happened with the Virgo thing. Now, that really doesn't bother us a lot, in terms of oh, if you build enough detectors, and uh, you will have always some number of them not have by accident have the source in that zone of silence. Okay. And if, if you know the detector works, you can use that information like we did with Virgo, that it is in the cone of silence, even though they didn't see anything. So the important thing is, I'll tell you why we more need more detectors. It's in part, if we want to ultimately look at all, I think the nice way of saying it is look at all the wonderful science that came out of the neutron star collision. Mm -hmm. Why? Because people were able to see, not only with a gravitational wave detector, but with all the other things that we have, all these telescopes that we already have, they were able to do something called multi-messenger astronomy. And from that, we learned a lot of stuff. Now, as we, we can, the neutron stars, because they make a, a display, but it turns out the black holes are in, in some regard, a little bit of a disappointment right now. Not that there's lots to be learned from the black holes, from the gravitational wave signal, but right by the, is not yet a, an identified electromagnetic signal from any of them. And we hope that will, there should be some. There's always some cloud of some accretion disk in that system. And when that black hole takes, becomes, a, when two black holes become one black hole, that's a pretty exciting event. There should be some sort of thing that you could see electromagnetically. But you have to be able to point so much better. And if we want to incorporate people in the astronomy business and tell them, go look at a black hole that's a billion light years away, which is where most of those black holes are. They're billions of light years away, billion, okay? Mm -hmm. 10 to the nine, in America, 10 to the nine, not, not the British military. You know. yeah. uh, so uh, the thing is that uh, that's getting out to a Z of 0.1 almost. And if, you, and if you're 10 billion years, you're at a Z of one. Mm -hmm. So you're really into very, very distant thing. And if you want to tell somebody where to look, there you have to tell a lot better where it is in terms of the unknown angle you know, the angle on the sky. Now, I think there's a big chance that something called LSST, you know, it's the Large Space Telescope, not, I forgot, it's a, it's a synoptic telescope that it looks at the sky all the time and looks for short events. That may very well finally make it so that we will see a black hole electromagnetically at the same time as we see it with, a, with the gravity wave detector. I hope that's what happens. Great, brilliant, thank you. Um, so we've got another question here. Can you explain more on symmetry and gravitational wave generation with relation to radiation, which should be observer independent? Well, I don't quite know what you mean by that. The symmetry has to be, uh, I'll tell you, because it, it's non, yeah, okay. Um, I'll, I'll be a little bit technical here, okay? I'm sorry, but the, the question leads to that. Um, the lowest multipole moment of a gravitational wave source, the very lowest, is the quadrupole, okay? 
Now, it turns out that um, it gives a pattern on the sky, which is strange. That's a, it turns out it, it's not the same pattern that a quadrupole of an ele electromagnetic kind would give. It turns out an electromagnetic quadrupole, and this is something I'll just tell you, you those of you who know how to do this calculation, if you, what you'll get is if you take and make an electro electromagnetic quadrupole, you will take, you make that with two plus charges. Mm -hmm. For example, when you take two plus charges and have them oscillate like that, they don't radiate dipole radiation. They will radiate quadrupole radiation. They hardly radiate because the, the radiation fields from the two charges cancel each other damn near. Mm -hmm. Okay. You see, the reason why is that remember the radiation field in electricity and magnetism goes as the charge times the acceleration. But the acceleration of these two things are equal and opposite. And the charges are equal, so they cancel each other. The only reason they don't cancel each other is because you as an observer see the one that's closer to you to first. And that makes a pattern, a radiation pattern that looks like a shamrock, okay? Uh, now, when you look at the quadrupole pattern that's made by two masses going back and forth like that of a mass type, you get a pattern which doesn't look that way at all. It looks like a dipole. It's very interesting. And that has to do with, uh, I've had, I've had to try to get people try to explain this in English to me, okay? It's not so easy. You have to do the arithmetic to show that. And, and the answer in the end is that you're looking at tensor, a tensor field rather than a vector field. That's not a good answer to somebody who hasn't thought about it, but <laughs> it's, an, it's the best answer you can get. So the, symmetry is the, the symmetries that are the radiation patterns are determined then by what are the higher multiple moments that you get from a, two objects that are going around each other in a circle, like two, you know, like what's going on in the black hole here. It's mostly quadrupolar, okay? And so it makes a dipole pattern, okay? Thank you. Um, well, slightly more abstract question here. Oh, let's take this one to the very broad question for uh, slightly other end of the spectrum. So, uh, are gravitational waves themselves affected by gravity? Say that again slowly. I, I... Are gravitational waves affected themselves by gravity? Yeah, that's a good point. Okay. Let, let me start. Do you mind if I, I, I answer? I will answer the question in a second. But let me start by answering one thing right so that everybody knows. You can take a gravitational wave and start at one edge of the universe. I mean, the edge of the universe is a sort of loosely speaking. Take a, a thing at a distance of 10 billion light years away from us, okay? Mm -hmm. And you send it all the way to the other edge of the universe. Mm -hmm. And it'll look much the same. It'll just be diluted by the fact that the wave has spread. Nothing has interacted with it. There's been not, no absorption. There's been no thing that interacted in any way with it, even though it has made little tiny stretches in every galaxy that went along. It's tiny. So it turns out these are the most penetrating waves that, that you can ever find. They're better than neutrinos. Neutrinos scatter off things. A gravitational wave goes through everything and does nothing happens to it. And that's why it's so interesting. You see, if you, you can look all the way back with these things to the beginning of the universe if you want. They don't get scattered by anything that happens in, the, in, the, in between. And we hope, for example, we'll eventually see a supernova this way. And we look at the supernova, we'll look right into the supernova and see what really is going on. So, okay, so the question you asked is, will a gravitational wave push around or pull on another? Of course it does. It's energy. And, and, and for example, gravitational waves will get bent just like the light gets bent by gravity, it was everything that like, it gets bent. But it's, it, the gra but a gravitational wave doesn't carry enough energy really to do a lot of bending. In other words, one gravitational wave will, yes, will bend another one, but it's very, very, very tiny. So again, the best way to think about gravitational waves is they don't interact with anything. Great, thank you. That's also why it's so hard to see them. You, know, you have to build a LIGO to see him. <laughs> um, okay. um, what are the three most pressing, just this is more general question for more global physics. What are the three most pressing discoveries to be made in global physics um, in the coming years? In your opinion? This is a well, question. Yeah, you're asking what will be interesting that comes out of this. Yeah. Um, 
Well, I think a lot of things will come out of it. I think we've just started. I think, even though we talk about gravitational waves or in general, what uh, are the most, so both, for, yeah. for gravitational waves? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I think in general, I think these, these may be related. I think we have a real puzzle. I don't know if gravitational waves will say a lot about that puzzle, but we have a fantastic puzzle. We don't know what the hell is in the universe. We thought we did, but we don't. Most of what's out there is two things. One of them is something called the dark matter. We know that that's there because we see everything. We can see that in the cosmic background radiation. We can see that in the formation of galaxies. There's more matter out there than you see by your, what you can see with the instruments. And it's something like, uh, I don't know, 20 times more in dark matter than matter that you think you know about. What that stuff is, is extremely exciting. We'd love to know. We don't know. And a, a hell of a lot of physicists are right now trying, uh, and astronomers are trying to do experiments or do observations to try to figure out what that stuff is. It may have something to do with gravity waves, but I, gravitational waves, I don't think so. The other thing we don't know about the universe is where most of the energy is. And that turns out to be in something called dark energy. And that is a mystery that I think is deeper than the dark matter. We're going to probably find dark matter sometime. But the dark energy has an interesting thing, which may ultimately have something to do with gravitational waves. Uh, I don't know that. But what it is, is you can get the dark energy to work by doing a little trick on Einstein's equations. You can take Einstein's equations and add another term to the Einstein equations called the cosmological term. Einstein did that himself. Mm -hmm. He did that back when he first was thinking about cosmology, but he didn't know that the universe was expanding. He thought the universe was static. And uh, so he invented a term that you could add to the field equations, his, his two equations, his equation, that made it look like gravity was a little bit repulsive, not just attractive gravity, but repulsive gravity, gravity that pushes things apart. And it turns out that you need to have that if you want to have inflation. So people, if your inflation's right, you got to have gravity being pushing things apart. If you want to explain the current Hubble law and the way we see acceleration in the universe, gravity has to be pushing things apart also. And you can fix that by putting in the cosmological term. In other words, don't put it in to make this universe stationary. Make it so you see why it's expanding faster than you, it should. Now, the trouble with that is it doesn't work with the other theories we know and that we know we know and love. It doesn't work with quantum theory. Quantum theory can't come to terms with that cosmological constant. And that's a fundamental puzzle which may come out of understanding the universe better. You know, that's why it's very interesting to look at that radiation that comes from the moment of inflation. We might learn something, something really important. Uh, or by looking at a black hole in a, in a very, very much more sensitive way. So those are two puzzles. The things that are bread and butter, but also extremely interesting are, well, we can test Einstein's theory to really enormous precision. And it's a theory that is remarkable. I mean, right now it looks like Einstein's theory works all the way from uh, things which are lighter than a, a milligram and distances of uh, a micron, well, not 20 microns, all the way up to distances the size of the universe and masses moving at the velocity of light. It's just, I mean, it's amazing. It works for this incredible band of range of physical parameters. And remember, the guy made it up in his head. I mean, that's, that it should work that well over all, all of nature is just unbelievable. Anyway, that test, keep testing that is very important. But the other thing is we might see a supernova that will tell, I mean, people have worried about supernova, trying to figure out how they work for years. One observation with a gravity wave, gravitational wave will tell enormous amounts of that. So that's something that's really in our future. And then we probably will find new sources of gravitational waves we have never even thought about because we didn't have the way of doing it. So I'm, I'm very optimistic, both for explaining things we know better than we know them now, and for looking for things we have never even thought about. So it's a wonderful new field. Great. Um, and so as a last question, something that we ask uh, all of our speakers, um, we have a lot of students tuning in um, and a lot of early stage uh, researchers. Uh, what advice would you give to um, early career researchers um, in terms what, of- what, what, say, say it slowly. What do I give to early what? 
early stage researchers. So I don't understand that word. Early stage what? The, the, the start of their career in research. Early stage references is what you're saying? No, sorry. People who are starting off their career in research. Yes. Yeah. So what advice would you give them in terms of shaping their focus? Okay, I understand. So, I mean, okay. Well, that's a long story, but I mean, I, I best example I can give you is me. Okay, everybody has different experiences. Mm -hmm. um, um, I became interested in physics after I flunked out of MIT, failed. And I got, I worked as a technician in a lab and the guy who ran that lab made me into a physicist, okay? And he worked on atomic clocks and then I got interested in relativity and ultimately. So you fall into things. Mm -hmm. It's not that you can design, I'm trying to tell you, it isn't just you can plan and everything will work just as your plan made it out. But you gotta do something, you gotta keep trying. And that's the most important part. And the most important part, I think, and you'll laugh at this, is to have fun with it. If it isn't any fun, you won't work on it. Mm. It's just you'll, you'll, you'll do something else instead. So you've got to pick an area that you get a kick out of. Don't go into an area that you don't, you, you don't think is interesting. You gotta, and, and when you work on it, you have to feel that you're really getting pleasure out of it. That's my best advice to anybody aspiring to be a scientist. Excellent advice, honestly. Yeah. Okay. All right. Good. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. Yeah. And a big thank you on behalf of all of our viewers as well who've tuned in and have really thoroughly enjoyed the lecture. Um, thank you so much for your time. Okay, you're quite welcome. Okay. Oh, I wish you a good bit of luck with where we go next. But I, okay. I, uh, tell me about it when it happens. Okay. I'd like to know. I will do. All right. Bye bye. Take care. Bye. Bye bye.